Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on work and energy. The topic of this video is analyzing forces and systems. And we want to know what is meant by a system and how can it be used to do an energy analysis? What is a conservative force and how is it related to the amount of mechanical energy? And finally, what effect do non-conservative forces have upon the energy of a system? I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Mechanical energy is often defined as the ability to do work. While this is an accurate definition, it's not the most useful definition for a beginning student of physics. In this video and the ones that follow, we'll take a more pragmatic approach to energy, learning how to use it as a bookkeeping tool that allows us to answer questions like, how fast will the object be traveling, how high will it go, or how far will it skid? When you think about energy, it's a lot like money. Money is something you can count and quantify and keep track of. You can know what form the money is in, whether it's in a checking account or an investment account. You can know whether the money's coming in or whether the money's going out. You can even make predictions about how much money you might have at a future moment in time. Energy is just like money. You can know how much you have. You can count it, you can quantify it, you can measure it, and you can calculate it. You can know what form it's in, whether it's in kinetic or potential or any other form of energy. And you can know whether the amount of that form is increasing or decreasing and whether there's energy coming in or energy going out. The fact is, energy is a bookkeeping tool. And that's how we'll learn to use it in this video and the ones that follow. When an accountant attempts to keep track of a client's money, it's important that that accountant precisely define who the client is. For instance, consider Jack and Jill, who are married, and each has their individual accounts at a bank. But they also own some things in common, like a house and a couple of cars. When thinking about Jack and Jill's money, it's important to think of them as a single entity, as a system. In such a case, when they're considered a system, the individual money owned by Jack and the individual money owned by Jill is actually their together money. It's part of the system, the combined money. If there's a transfer of money from Jill's account to Jack's account, well, that's an internal transfer, and it doesn't affect the amount of money possessed by the system. On the other hand, if there's a transfer from Jill's employer to her savings account, or from Jack's employer to his savings account, well, that's an external transfer, and that does change the amount of money possessed by the system. The same can be said of the external transfer to the credit card company. It changes the amount of money possessed by Jack and Jill. When we think of Jack and Jill's money in this way, as a system, we consider an imaginary boundary that surrounds Jack and Jill, and we think of money passing across the boundary to change the amount of money that's inside that system. This type of thinking, system thinking, is useful whenever you're trying to keep track of something. We'll use it for money, and we'll use it for energy. When analyzing a motion from an energy standpoint, it's important to define the system and the boundary that separates the system from the surroundings. We have to ask what is the system? What object or object is part of the system? Once we've answered that, we can then answer the question, is work being done on the system by objects outside of it in order to have an external energy transfer, thus changing the amount of energy in the system? Or are forces acting between objects within the system in order to transfer energy from one object to the other, or from one form to another? When we think of objects in this way, as a system, we can begin to do our energy analysis and keep track of energy. When thinking about the forces that could do work upon objects, it's important to distinguish between those that are conservative and those that are non-conservative. Technically speaking, a force is a conservative force if the amount of work that it does on an object as it moves between two locations is independent of the path that the object takes between those two locations. The two classic conservative forces that we'll talk about are gravity force and spring force. Let's consider a gravity force first using this diagram to help. There's two paths of a ball taken from the ground up to a final location 20 meters above the ground. In the first path, the ball travels all the way up to its highest point and then back down to its 20 meter location. There's negative work done by the gravity force as it moves upward and a little less positive force as it moves downward. But the total amount of negative work done in path A would be the same as the amount of work done in path B where the ball simply moves from ground level straight up to the 20 meter mark. In this case, gravity is a 
conservative force because the amount of work it does up on the ball is independent of whether the ball takes path A or path B. Spring force is another conservative force. If you attach a block to the end of a spring and the block oscillates from one location to a final location approximately 20 centimeters below it, it wouldn't matter whether the, the, the path was an up and down oscillating path or simply the straight path from the initial to the final location. The amount of work done by the spring force would be the same regardless of the path and that's why it's a conservative force. When the only forces doing net work upon an object are conservative forces, then the total mechanical energy of the object is conserved. The Ke might change to Pe, or the Pe back to Ke, but the sum of Ke plus Pe, the total mechanical energy, would be constant. As an illustration, consider this diagram of a projectile launched with 100 joules of kinetic energy at ground level, where the potential energy is zero. At the start of its motion, it has 100 joules of total mechanical energy, and the only forces doing work on the projectile would be gravity. By the time it reaches the peak of its trajectory, its potential energy could be 80 joules, and its kinetic energy would have to go down to 20 joules, but the total remains 100 joules. When it reaches the ground, or just before reaching the ground, it would be back to 100 joules of total mechanical energy, all in the form of kinetic energy. At every point along its trajectory, the total mechanical energy would be 100 joules. The sum of kinetic and potential would be the same. As the potential energy goes up, the kinetic energy goes down, and as the potential energy goes down, the kinetic energy goes up, but the total remains constant. If gravity and spring forces are the conservative forces, then all other forces are non-conservative forces. And when a non-conservative force does work upon a system, it changes the total mechanical energy of the system. Such forces are capable of transferring energy across the boundary between system and surroundings. As an example, consider this diagram of a foot kicking a football. If we call the system the football, then upon contact with the football, the foot does positive work upon the football and gives it connection energy. It changes the total mechanical energy of the football. In this diagram, we'll consider the hammer to be the system, and when it contacts the nail, the nail does negative work upon the hammer in order to transfer energy out of the system, thus reducing the kinetic energy of the moving hammer. In the final diagram, consider the barbell to be the system, and the strong man does positive work upon the barbell in lifting it from the ground to above his head, thus giving it additional potential energy. In all these situations, there's an external force, a non-conservative force, doing net work upon the system in order to change the mechanical energy of the system. One of the most fundamental laws in science is the law of energy conservation, which states that energy is neither created nor destroyed, but only transferred from one form to another and from one object to another. In other words, the total energy of the universe is constant or conserved. Here the universe refers to the system plus everything outside the system in the surroundings. Let's use the principle to revisit the collision between the foot and the football. When we did our analysis, the football was considered the system. So every Everything outside the football is the surroundings. It was the foot and everything else. We'll call the universe the foot plus the football. And we'll think about the changes that occur inside of this universe. First, the ball gained some kinetic energy when the foot kicked it, but the foot slowed down so it would have lost some kinetic energy. These are changes in mechanical energy occurring inside the universe, but there's also changes that occur in non-mechanical forms of energy. For instance, there's the expenditure of chemical energy by the football player in doing this activity of kicking the football. So chemical energy decreases. But there's also some vibrational energy changes. Upon collision between the foot and the football, the football begins to vibrate, even producing some sound, and that's vibrational energy. So there's all these changes occurring within the universe. But the total amount of change, when you add up all the changes, would be zero. That is, if there's a loss of one form of energy somewhere in the universe, there's a gain of another form of energy somewhere in the universe, such that the total amount of energy change in the universe is zero. That is, total energy is conserved. 
It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website. I've left links to each of them in the description section of this video. You have two concept builders and a tutorial page. Any one of these would be great next steps for making the learning stick. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.